This may not be a totally accurate or credible uh, graphic, but it does represent, I think, the uh, issue with American trust in the news media. It has just plummeted over the last, uh, you know, really decade or so, but especially in the last few years here, it's just plummeted. People don't trust the media. They don't find the media credible. And that's an issue for us as PR professionals, because we depend on the media and, and to reach our audiences. So we want to do what we can to uh, ensure the credibility of the media. But in this video, I want to take a look at what is the, the challenge of media credibility, how that impacts us and what we can do to um, kind of uh, help correct that issue for our own uh, benefit, to be quite honest, our own selfish interests in having a credible uh, media. So let's start by defining, you know, what this popular term, we've had this popular term come up recently, <laughs> fake news, and uh, the, the idea of fake news. And what is fake news? So Let's just take a look and dive into what we call fake news. So to differentiate between a few important terms, first of all, there's false news, which is just news that's not true, right? The news that, that people put out there that they just know is not true and, and they're, they're not credible sources and they're just, they're just making stories up for the purpose of um, their own agenda or for just, you know, riling up an audience. Or, so this is news that is just absolutely the people putting it out and know that it's 100% not true. That's what we call false news news. Right? Then there's also this idea of mistaken news where people are putting out information that they think is correct, that they, that they, they think is reliable and turns out to not be correct. So, you know, the most famous incident in this is when the Chicago Daily Tribune and some other newspapers put out, you know, they already printed up these, these uh, papers that said Dewey defeats Truman in the, uh, the presidential election for that year. Turned out not to be true. Truman won in a surprise. So, but that was mistaken. It was not, you know, an issue of these people knew the Truman one, put it out anyway, and that's false news. But mistaken news is where you just get it wrong. You make a mistake. So you have to correct and apologize and go back and so forth. And then there's what has become called fake news. Fake news really is just news that the person on the other end of it doesn't like. This is a favorite, a favorite um, refrain from former President Donald Trump, who um, likes to decry fake news all the time when somebody prints something negative about him or something he disagrees with, doesn't like. He labels it fake news. That doesn't mean it's not true. It just means that, you know, it's a way for him to, and, and others who use that term to try and um, discredit that story, uh, whether or not it's, it's true is another issue entirely. So um, we need to be aware of that as well. So when, when we see, you know, we would see things like uh, Tom's tracks to show critical losses of years and tax avoidance, uh, we would see that in one paper and, and he would decry that as fake news, right? And, and another news outlet might not even carry that. So they're not carrying fake news then, right? He's, they're carrying uh, um, good news, according to him. But uh, just because you don't like it doesn't necessarily mean it's fake news. But so we need to be aware of that term and, and really uh, differentiate between false news, mistaken news, and fake news. Then. So why do we believe it? Why do we believe that there is such a thing as fake news? Why do we believe when people say, well, that's fake news? Um, well, first of all, there's declining trust in the media. There just is. Media outlets have, have you know, used to be uh, like the, the basically what their word was was gold, right? When, when Walter Cronkite said something, you believed it was true. You knew it was true in your heart. And, uh, and, and he had credibility in that regard. Now we don't have that so much because we have so much contrast, so many different outlets, so many different perspectives taking place on uh, media that uh, we just have this declining trust in the media and the fact that the, and the idea that they're giving us accurate news. So it's easy for us to believe that some of this news may be fake news or false news. Right. There's also been this blurring of journalism and opinion. We'll talk more about this in a few minutes, but um, the idea that uh, that. Uh, People on news channels really have opinion shows a lot of times. They're, they're expressing opinions rather than fact and rather than following an actual news story, they're they're shaping opinion. And so they have these opinion shows. And there's been a blurring of that because so many more of these opinion shows are showing up on quote unquote news channels. There's also a lack of media literacy just among our population. We don't have the critical thinking skills anymore. We just kind of get stuck in these echo chambers and we just believe whatever they say on our particular news outlet of choice. Um, we don't we don't critically think about those things. We don't have the media literacy skills to differentiate and to, to make our own decisions on those things. Uh, there's just been a large shift in consumption methods. Um, so people get stuck in these echo chambers. We, we, we consume news not from, you know, 
the nightly news, which had these standards of, of, of journalistic integrities. But now we get our news from Facebook and from Twitter and from news outlets that have a particular spin and a particular perspective. And, and, and so we, we get stuck in these echo chambers. Then we don't get news from other sources or information from other sources. So uh, we just get stuck in these, in these kind of like in echo chambers and, and stuck in the, the repetitious rhetoric of a particular news outlet. So, uh, speaking of which repetition, we hear the same things over and over and over again. They start to use the same terms and they use the same stories and they talk about them forever, whether or not it's really news or not. Uh, because again, we need to remember that the media is a business. The media is not you know, strictly for information or entertainment or whatever. They're there to make money. They're there to do whatever they can to pull in audiences, which pulls in advertising dollars and, and, and sponsorship dollars and things like that. So they're going to repeat a story that they think people are interested in. And you get that a lot and you get the same terms and people start to repeat it then. And, uh, oh my gosh, it becomes just so repetitious. And this is not exclusive to one side of things or another. This is true for all uh, media outlets. We are, we've become, our consumption methods have changed to become very focused on particular news outlets. And they know one way to, to, to keep us hooked is to keep repeating the same thing. And it becomes comfortable, it becomes familiar to us. So we believe fake news for a lot of those reasons. We believe that it is fake news. So what can we do then to combat fake news, to, to fight against fake news? Well, first we can follow ethical guidelines. We can follow ethical journalistic guidelines, even as PR folks, as certainly as journalists, we can, we can expect them to follow these guidelines, but even as, as you know, an audience member or as, as public relations professionals, we can follow these, the, the code of ethics set forth by different societies. And, and this one happens to be from the Society of Professional Journalists. But we can seek truth and report it. We can minimize harm. We can act independently and we can be accountable and transparent. If we follow those ethical guidelines, then we can, we can help uh, combat this idea of fake news and, and ho hopefully start to increase trust in the media again. We can label advocacy and commentary uh, by differentiating between the news function of a news channel and an opinion function. So this just happens to be Fox News. So Brett Baer is, you know, a respected journalist. He's somebody who studied this and really follows those ethical guidelines. And and uh, and so he is a, a true journalist and, and follows and it's part of the news function of Fox News. Tucker Carlson is not. He's an opinion show. He's an opinion maker. He's not a journalist, which is fine. He has the commentary and that's fine. Fox News is a business. They're there to bring in audiences. And so that's one that way that they do it. I'm not arguing that Tucker Carlson should not have a show, whether you like him or not. I mean, he's he's pulls in a lot of money for Fox News. So it's totally legitimate. But we need to label that as Look, this is not a news show. This is an opinion show, I'm not really distributing facts here so much as opinions and uh, and perspective on things. And so we need to differentiate between those things. And to be fair, MSNBC does the exact same thing. They have a they have more of a news function and people who are more follow that uh, that straight up news function. And then they have lots of opinion shows. CNN does the same. They all these news uh, current contemporary news channels do the same thing. I just happen to highlight Fox News here because it was easy to find. Uh, examples of that, but, but all of these places do it. It's not just Fox news to be clear, but we need to differentiate between advocacy and commentary when we need to let, well, we need to label those things and differentiate the, those from the news function of an organization. We also need to support media literacy. We need to get people more up to date on being critical thinkers and not just blindly accepting everything that's said on their favorite news channel or on Twitter or on wherever they get their news. We need to teach people to think more critically in, in identifying, you know, fact versus commentary and advocacy in these situations. So another thing we need to talk about in, in the media, and this, unfortunately, is what we call post-truth. We're in a post-truth area era for media, which a uh, post-truth means circumstances in which objective facts are less influential in shaping public opinion than appeals to emotion and personal belief. So we have people spouting off a lot of just, you know, feelings and not really facts, but just, you know, tr using emotional appeal, whether that's fear, whether that's, um, whether that's hope, whether it's whatever, as opposed to, um, basic facts. And so people, people, uh, persuading people and, and firing people up based on emotion and personal belief rather than objective facts, rather than providing people with information and let them make their own decision. They, they really uh, appeal to emotion and drive people through emotion and through uh, their personal beliefs. So again, not to be 
this drum too heavily, but uh, Donald Trump is the main example of this in the post-truth era, that somebody who doesn't rely on facts, doesn't really care about the actual facts, and, and really just focuses on appealing to emotion, whatever it is he can use to fire an audience up, right? So, um, so one example of this that came very early in the Trump administration was his claim that, uh, and then he forced his spokesman to go out and say, yeah, the largest audience ever, largest audience for a largest crowd ever for a, uh, um, for a, a presidential inauguration, which is just objectively not true. They kept saying this, that it was the largest crowd ever for a, a, a presidential inauguration. Here's a photo from the National Park Service of, you know, just an objective photo of the, the presidential inauguration at a particular time. Now compare this to uh, Obama's initial inauguration in 2009. You can see, obviously, objectively, there are far more people at the Obama inauguration. So just saying that, you know, they had the largest crowd ever for an inauguration, clearly not true. And in fact, they kept pressing this and pressing this, even when evidence came out about it to the point where Kellyanne Conway, one of his advisors, came out and kind of made up this word of alternative facts, alternative facts. What is alternative facts? How is that possible? A fact is a fact. There are no alternative facts. There's, there's different perspective, right? But we live in this post-truth era where we rely more on emotion and appeals to people's personal beliefs and things as opposed to even when they're in contrast and could directly contradict objective fact. So we just need to realize that we are in that type of news um, a cycle right now. We're in that type of world. That's the era we, era we live in is this post-truth fake news era. So we need to understand that. So what then is the impact of all this on PR professionals? The, the, you know, in the interest of media credibility, what is the impact for public relations professionals? Well, we need to recognize that we have all kinds of different people that we're trying to reach, and we need to certainly identify an audience, as we talked about in a previous video. But <clears throat> excuse me, but we also need to understand that you know, close audiences may have different perspectives. So, in my household, you have my in-laws who love Fox News. Fox News is on twenty-four hours a day in their house. They love Fox News. They believe everything Fox News says. And then in contrast to that, uh, my wife is a diehard MSNBC fan. So obviously in direct, direct conflict, one of the news they're getting and, and the audiences that they're reaching. So just, you know, my in-laws and my wife had those different, but my dad, then my parents are pretty traditional. They watch the nightly news, pretty straight up news function, watching the nightly news without a lot of advocacy and, 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 uh, commentary. So they watch that. And I'm more interested in a broader perspective that goes beyond the United States. So I watch a lot of BBC news or, and take in a lot of BBC news because it gives that worldly perspective and a different perspective. I don't really pay much attention to the news that's coming from us outlets. So I mean, we are just within my household and within my, you know, kind of immediate family here, uh, very diverse in terms of our news intake. And that can be a real challenge for PR professionals, right? To understand that there are people in that, just in my group that would have such different perspectives on our news gathering and, and what we're looking for. So we need to understand that uh, diverse audiences trust media for diverse reasons that we all have different reasons. My in-laws have a reason for trusting Fox News. My wife has a reason for trusting MSNBC. My parents have a reason for enjoying and trusting the, the, the nightly news, the national nightly news. And I have a reason for, for going to, to BBC for my news. Diverse audiences trust media for diverse reasons. We need to understand that if we're going to understand our audience and try and reach them through what we would define as a credible news source, we understand that that's going to be different for different audiences because they trust uh, the media for diverse reasons. So key in that is, is what we can do then to support diversity in the media, specifically diversity. And what can we do to kind of combat all this and, and support diversity in the media? Um, first of all, we can feature minority subject matter experts. When we, when we present information as PR professionals, when we, ha when we put people out there, when we, uh, we present them as subject matter experts talking on our behalf. We need to feature minorities in that group um, and not just run out the same, you know, middle-aged white guys that we have for years and years and years. We need to, to be representative and to reach a, an audience. You want to, you want to see, they want to see themselves represented. Uh, now that does not mean put somebody out there who's unqualified, but there, there are certainly uh, other people in your organization who can serve as subject matter experts who uh, come from a, a minority base. And so when we have that opportunity, we want to do that. We want to feature minorities as subject matter experts. 
We can do things like provide media kits in different languages. If we live in a community that where there's a, a really uh, high percentage of Hispanic population, we can we can present that material in Spanish or whatever population we have there. We can we can try and reach them in their um, native language, their home language and make that more comfortable for them. We can make sign language interpreters available. We see this a lot more, especially, you know, if you noticed in the pandemic, when government officials were giving press conferences, there was typically a sign language interpreter there uh, relaying that information through sign language. We can take some basic steps like that to make information more accessible to people with, um, with, with differing abilities. So we can make sign language interpreters available. We can include, co include co closed captioning. Uh, again, for people who may have a hearing um, issue, we can include that closed captioning for, for material to make it easier for them to access the information. We can work with community-based media, not just focus on national media, international media. We can focus on localized media, community-based media that are going to reach a particular audience in that way. We can partner with opinion leaders from diverse communities um, within, our, within our own community. When we recognize that we have these diverse communities, we can partner with opinion leaders from there and, uh, and try and reach them, reach those communities uh, by, by accessing those, those kind of gatekeepers and influencers within that community. But really, the, the main idea here is it's upon us, it, it's incumbent upon us as public relations professionals to help start building trust in the media. It not only is important ethically for us, but it's important just for in a practical sense. We need the media to, to be able to connect with our audiences and leverage the media for reaching our, an audience and, and promoting whatever it is we're trying to promote in our organization. So it behooves us to help build that trust again in the media and build media credibility along with them so that audience, audiences will have greater trust in what it is we're saying. Hopefully you have a renewed understanding of media credibility, the importance of media credibility, and what we can do as public relations professionals to help build that trust again and, and create that trust in the media and build credibility there. It's an important function for us. If you have questions about media credibility or anything related to public relations and how we connect with the media and why that might be important, please feel free to email me. I'd love to hear from you there. In the meantime, I hope that you will do what you can to better understand the media, become a more critical consumer yourself, and also to improve the function of public relations in developing that media credibility.